Oh, hey, thanks for uh, watching this devotional today. You know, the first devotional we did in this series of Christ and the Church, uh, I addressed the uniqueness of Christ that's found in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And in that devotional, I mentioned within that theologically heavy and powerful description of words that Paul uses, there were four reasons for Christ Jesus, unprecedented, preeminent, as Savior. Uh, if you viewed that devotional, then you'll recall that I covered only two of the four, and I'd like to today cover the number three and number four reasons for Christ's preeminence. You know, I, I read something this past week that caused me to chuckle, and so I, I want to share it with you. And the story goes like this. When my father's company hired a consultant to improve efficiency, he immediately called a meeting of all the shop personnel. In stressing the importance of following a set of plans, engineered procedures, if you will, he gave this analogy. You are on a Titanic, and it's sinking, and you find yourself in a lifeboat. It's dark and it's hazy. Which direction do you row? Well, now you're in the same situation, but you have the ship's navigator with you. Which way would you row? Well, you'd row in the way the navigator told you to do, right? Well, in the crowd, there were murmurs of agreement until one man in the back piped up and he said this, well, I don't know. He's already hit one iceberg. Now, I, I chuckled. I thought it was pretty funny, but it's also true. If you have a Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. The navigator in this particular story that I read had a position of authority, but had no credibility. The third reason that Jesus is preeminent involves not only his position, but also his credibility. He is the head of the body, the church. Now, remember, there were false teachers Icebergs, uh, you might say, floating all around, threatening a shipwreck for the young Colossian church. And directing the church around these treacherous obstacles through the pen of the Apostle Paul was the master navigator, the Lord Jesus himself. In the preceding verses, there were a list, or there was a list of Jesus' credentials. Christ is over all of his creation, verse 16. He is also over that new creation, the church. And he is the head of that church, in verse 18. So you should know that Paul is not referring only to the church at Colossae, but rather he is talking about the universal church, the worldwide church for all ages. Yes, it is Jesus' rule in each one of these local congregations of believers around the world who professed him as Lord. So notice also that Christ achieved this status through his death and resurrection. His credentials are the firstborn from the dead. We find that in verse 18. Now we know that Jesus was not the first person to be raised from the dead, but he is the first person to overcome death and never die again. He is the head of of the body, the church. Jonathan Edwards writes this about the church and Christ. Christians are, are one society, one body, politic, and they are subject to the same king, Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He is the head of this body. Indeed, all men are subject to the power and providence of this king. But those who are in his kingdom of grace all acknowledge the same king. They own his rightful sovereignty over them, are willing to be subject to him, to submit to his will, and yield obedience to his commands. Now that's a strong statement. He is the head of the church. You know, my previous law enforcement career, I have never seen a body move when the head was severed. Physically speaking, the head is the control center of the body. The head gives direction, it provides plans, vision, empowerment. Jesus is the head of the church also. 
and he provides all the body needs for animation. With Jesus as the rightful head of the church, the church moves with its main interdependence parts in unity. John Piper often says God is the most glorified in us when we are most satisfied with him. Jesus Christ is infinitely satisfying. Church, may we find our satisfaction in him in order to rightfully glorify his name in all things. Well, the fourth reason Jesus is preeminent involves his salvation and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Well, salvation and eternal life only come through the sacrifice of Christ. Through Christ alone, God will reconcile all things to himself. Mankind and all of creation have been out of fellowship with God since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But there will come a time when God will bring everything back into fellowship with him and make everything right that has been wrong. So Christ is preeminent in his salvation because he has made peace through the blood of the cross. Colossians 1 verse 20. So we only have peace with God through the bloody sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But peace with God is available. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's found in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Our Lord Jesus Christ, preeminent over all. The question is, we must ask ourselves, is Jesus preeminent in our life? Is, his, is he our Savior? Are you following and honoring and serving him as your Lord? The good news is, you can choose to receive love and follow him even today if you don't already know him. Well, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you might be asking the question, how? How do I do that? Well, so I have an illustration here I'm going to show you that might help you understand a bit better. And the illustration is not my invention. I borrowed it from another. So let me show you this. Most of us have probably seen pictures of the Grand Canyon and uh, or have been to the Grand Canyon. Well, this is a, a crude rendition of something that represents the Grand Canyon. And in this, you'll see there's two cliffs. Those two cliffs represent the edges of the canyon. In the center, there's a great gap between the two. And on the left, I've listed this as holy God. On the right, I've listed this as sinful man. That's man slash woman. The great separation between the two. And humanity often tries to reach God through a variety of different ways. So let's say this. Let's say that I and you are standing on the edge of the cliff over here representing sinful man. And I say to you, I think I can reach God. And I say, I can jump that gap. And you say, you can't jump the gap. And I say, yes, I can. And I bet you can't. And so you say, well, because you're smart. You go first. So I run and I jump and I go down. I fall short of the edge. Now you, on the other hand, you're smart. You take a longer run and you jump. And you get almost to the edge. You even put your hand out and touch the dirt. But the reality is we both fell far short of reaching God. Now, spiritually speaking, men try to reach God through their good works, their good deeds, feeding the poor, um, saying prayers, going to church, maybe being baptized, all of those types of things. But the reality is, trying to reach God that way falls short. In Romans, in the book of Romans, 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It means miss the mark. They sin, they miss the mark of perfection. And in Romans 6.23, It says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And now think about that. The wages of sin is death. What you work for in your sin is to get death. All those who work, they get a paycheck. And the paycheck is what they've earned for what they have done. Here in the scriptures, in the book of Romans, Paul says, 
That is death, the things that you have done. So that's very significant in our life. So the reality is, John 3.16 says that there's only one way to bridge that gap between God and man. And that is done through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He being the one who was super sacrificed for our sins by his sinful or his holy death taking on our sinful lives man is able to walk across the cross to have an opportunity to have their sins forgiven and to meet this holy God now that's a crude rendition of this stuff and there's far other uh, greater more powerful statements in the scriptures but Romans 5 8 even says in that while we were still over here sinful man Christ died for us that we might be saved. So, thanks for listening to this devotional. If you have any questions about this or anything else I've said, please call Calvary Baptist Church at 714-962-6860 and anybody there will be more than willing to help you understand what this is, the good news, the gospel of Christ. Until next time, enjoy the scriptures.